Square back cars, as shown in figure 1 here, are some of the least aerodynamic cars. They have huge drag coefficients because their rears are just flat faces. That creates huge wakes, as we can see down in figure 4, and hence a lot of drag. And most of that drag is from something called pressure drag, which we'll cover a little bit later on in this podcast. Now, despite that, they're commonly still found on roads. And in this podcast, we'll look at a very easy way, actually, to reduce the drag of this type of car. It's, it's a very simple addition. And to do that, we'll use this paper called Characterization of the Unsteady Wake Aerodynamics for an Industry-Relevant Road Vehicle Geometry Using LES. Now, it's open access, and you can find the link below, and the DOI is just at the top of the page here. So the way these authors are trying to reduce the drag of this particular type of car can be seen in Figure 1, where on the right, we see the regular car. This is called the Nissan NDP, and this was a concept car back in a few years ago. Now on the left, we have the exact same car except for one feature, the rear edge. If we look closely, there's this very sharp extension out of the back, this sharp flat edge. Now, why would this extension be good for the car's aerodynamics? Well, the idea that it, we have is that it might reduce the car's drag. And the way it works is, in theory, that on the right, we have the car with the regular rear. There's no sharp edge, it's just a regular 90 degree edge, but that's still quite sharp, but not the extension. The wake that comes off this is very unsteady. That's because this car is effectively a bluff body now. As such, the wake flaps around in the back. And the idea of this rear extension on the left is that it gives the flow over the car a definite line to detach from, and it detaches far away from the actual car's surface, the rest of the car. That hopefully will reduce the unsteadiness of the wake, and with that, the drag too. And as a side note, if you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. Let's get back to this paper though. So is this approach of having this rear extension successful? Well, let's find out. In their method below, one really cool thing they did to help replicate their work is they also attached the STL file of the car in the supplementary material to this paper. They used a 15% scale model, and that might seem like an odd choice considering that they're doing CFD for this research, so they could do the full scale car, no problem. But the reason why they chose a scale version of this car is that they chose something called WRLES for the CFD approach. Now, this term might seem foreign, and it kind of is. Um, so in CFD, there are a bunch of different ways you can simulate the flow. You can use RANS, URANS, DES, LES, and DNS, among others. DES, which is a hybrid of URANS and LES, is a typical standard industry approach, and you can get quite good results with it. These authors are using something called a WRLES, which is now a step up from DES. So the major difference is that for the DES, you use the RANS approach to model the turbulence near the wall. You use some equations which aren't that accurate, but they are good enough to determine what the turbulence is doing, the production, the destruction, etc. In the WRLES approach, you actually resolve the turbulence structures themselves, the eddies. So you actually figure out directly what is happening in the boundary layer and close to the wall, all these little um, turbulence structures and whether they're going to grow or whether they're going to die out. So the problem with that is because you're resolving them and not using approximate equations like you would in uh, RERANS or DES to infer what the turbulence is doing based on other properties, you need a very fine mesh. And that means you need to have a lot of cells. So that means you need a lot of computational resources too. By reducing the size of the geometry, you reduce the number of cells you need in two ways. The first is that you naturally need fewer cells because the geometry is smaller, so you don't need to have as many cells covering as big a region. Then the second way is that because the geometry is smaller, the Reynolds number is lower too, and the turbulence is now less complicated. So the cells don't need to be as small. This second reason is also a problem that DNS runs into as well. So by reducing the geometry size, the authors can dramatically reduce how many cells they need and hence the computational resources needed too. And we actually see this problem coming into play when it comes to the speed that they selected for their car as well. So they chose a speed of 4.9 meters per second, so about 18 kilometers per hour. That's very slow, and you could run faster than that. You could probably crawl faster than that. And in fact, this speed wouldn't get any attention from manufacturers because at this speed, the drag of the vehicle is pretty much unimportant. The force is so low that it's 
not really worth worrying about. But the reason why the velocity is so low here in the simulation is because the higher the speed is, the smaller the turbulent structures can exist. That then means you need smaller cells to pick up that turbulence in your simulation, and that means that you need to have more cells, and that's a more expensive computational um, approach. And the reason why the turbulent structures can be smaller when you go to higher Reynolds numbers and higher speeds is because of what the Reynolds number means. So if you have a higher speed, it means you have a higher Reynolds number in general. And on our YouTube channel, we go through in detail more what Reynolds number means, and that's in a video called Area Fundamentals Number 2, Reynolds Number Explained, for those who want to uh, see that in more detail. But just briefly, we'll explain what the Reynolds number is um, approximately, and that is the ratio of the inertial forces compared to the viscous forces. So the top line in the equation is the inertial forces, the bottom line is the viscous forces. And what that means is that the higher the Reynolds number is, the smaller the structures can exist because their inertia is higher and viscosity isn't suppressed, isn't suppressing them to the point of extinction. As such, a lower Reynolds number like here means that the turbulent structures can exist um, here can only be larger, they can't be smaller. So the higher the speed is, the smaller the turbulent structures can be. And as such, you need more cells there. So if you have a, a lower Reynolds number, the turbulent structures can't be as small so you don't need to have as small as cells here, which means you don't need to get as many cells in your simulation, which means that you can have fewer cells. But speaking of all these cells and how many you do need, how many did the authors actually need here? Well, in table one, we see the effects of the mesh size in millions of cells, just here, on the average drag and lift coefficients, among other things. Now, the authors concluded from this table that 27 million cells were enough. And from this table alone, I wouldn't, be so quick to agree because the drag coefficient and lift coefficient both change quite a bit still going from 27 million cells to 50 million cells and these values uh, change about the same amount as going from 19 million cells to 27 million cells so i don't think that the solution has converged yet based on this mesh for the dart for the forces here but this is just looking at the force data if we look at figure four we can now see the weight behind the car with different numbers of cells so right here. Here, at the very least, many similarities occur, all um, occurring with these big flow features here. And to me, almost all the finer details are the same too between the 27 million cell mesh and the 50 million cell meshes. So from this point of view, going with the 27 million cell mesh is completely fine because the qualitative um, results are fine. The force data, not so much. And then we get even more confidence, though, in the 27 million cell mesh when we look at figure 5. So in this figure, in the left column, we see the isosurfaces of when the, the, instantaneous the instantaneous turbulent eddy viscosity ratio is 5 or more. So what that means is that these plots in the left column show how much of the flow and where in the flow the instantaneous turbulent eddy viscosity ratio is 5 or more. Then in the right column, we see the exact same thing, but for 10. So what we see here is that for the left column, the 27 million cell mesh is pretty good. It's almost the same as 50 million cells here, but in the right column, the 27 million cell mesh is almost identical now to the 50 million cell mesh and in uh, the locations as well in general. So what that tells us is that the smaller turbulence isn't being picked up by the 27 million cell mesh here, because in the now, uh, left column, we don't see as much in the small scale stuff. But in the 50 million cell mesh, we see almost everything being picked up between the two. And that makes sense because the coarseness of the mesh is what determines how small the turbulent structures you pick up can be. So this, little, this figure literally shows how different numbers of cells affect how much turbulence you can properly resolve. We mentioned earlier where the larger the cells are, the um, larger the terminus has to be in order to pick it up. So because we have fewer cells in the 27 million cell mesh in the um, five ISO contours, we can't pick up the small scale stuff as well because the cells aren't as fine. But the larger stuff, so the 10 um, ISO surfaces, they're fine. Now, just for general information, in figure seven, we see the Y plus value over the geometry. Scrolling down here. And overall, it's very good. Pretty much the entire car is below one, so that's good. That means that the boundary layer is being resolved quite well. 
Now, these simulations were done with OpenFoam, and if you'd like to learn OpenFoam, then check out our Black Friday specials on our courses here. I think you might like them. Now, before we get into the results, I just want to quickly cover one more thing because the authors here give a, perhaps the best explanation actually of what I've ever seen for the description of pod. So pod, if you haven't heard this term, it stands for proper orthogonal decomposition, pod. Now that name sounds intimidating, but that's why I wanted to cover how the authors described it here because they do a great job succinctly, succinctly describing what it is. So they say that pod is a method that extracts the coherent flow structures by breaking down the provided data set into a minimum number of basic functions that together encompass the majority of the flow field energy. This means that pod captures and ranks modes based on energy content. In other words, pod figures out what structures are in the flow based on the energy. That's a very succinct way of putting it because often you'll just see a bunch of mathematics and not really a good explanation of what it is, as you can see here in equations 10, 11, and 12. But this is just a very good description in regular terms. These equations just group the flow structures based on energy content and frequency, and then you can figure out what these actual structures are that are all jumbled together. Because in a car's wake, there are a bunch of structures all jumbled together that it's very difficult to see what they are just looking at the flow fields. For example, in figure uh, four back here, when we saw the isocontours or figure sorry, five, there are a bunch of different structures going on here and all related to the car, but not necessarily related to each other. Pod can break these up. So that's a very good description of pod. Anyway, let's now jump to the results. So in figure 11, we see the mean pressure around the two different setups. It's important to note that this is the mean pressure because the pressure does fluctuate with time. Here we go. So the pressure mean goes from minus 5 pascals to plus 5 pascals. And that might seem quite like a quite low value. But remember, this is at 18 kilometers per hour. And it's important to note that this mean pressure um, is mean because the pressures do fluctuate with time because it is a transient simulation. And from these plots, there are a few things to note. The first is that the front and top are almost identical because the two different shapes, um, they're quite similar at the front. Like it's only at the back that we do get differences. Now, the underneath changes slightly. It seems like underneath, between the front and rear wheels, we experience a lower pressure in the bottom figure. So the bottom figure is for the car with the rear extensions. And it's likely that because the rear flow is different now, the rear wake of the car without the extension, so the upper plot here, has much lower pressure in the wake. That is going to suck through the air underneath more easily and change that flow underneath there. With the um, NDP with cavity, that's with the car with extensions, the higher pressure in the rear is going to make the flow underneath and not follow the same path. So that is likely at least one of the major reasons why the underneath is a little different. And these plots suggest that the rear ex edge extension produce higher pressure behind the car, which will then reduce the drag because there's less pressure pushing, pulling the car back. And at the same time, the underneath has lower pressure too, so the downforce increases as well. From these two figures, it seems like the rear edge extensions are all around good, but there's more to see for the flow field than just this plane. This, these two plots are just for the center plane. Now in figure 14, we see the main draw card of the rear edge extensions. These figures show the vortices shed off the rear edge of the car, the left plot is for the regular flat back, while the right plot is with the rear edges. With the rear edges, the vortices seem smaller and possibly weaker. That makes complete sense because these vortices are forming because the object is a bluff body. And when it comes to bluff bodies, the more rounded the rear face is, the more the, the flow can wrap around the car, and that, that exacerbates the vortices produced. So having very sharp rear edges, like we have with extensions, makes the flow separate at a very defined point. That helps the vortices shed and their, reduce the vortices shed and their strength. And that is really what we're seeing here. Now in figure 16, we see the same center plane, but now with the mean velocity plotted and along with licks. So these licks, they show us where the flow is going in this plane. And the top is for the regular car, while the bottom is for the car with extensions. And these licks and this kind of plot, we've done a bunch of these ones for our videos on our YouTube channel too. So if you're familiar with those, these will be very familiar as well to you. 
So the authors have drawn red lines showing the differences in locations for the various features in the wake. These lines show that the car with extensions has a wake that extends back further. But from what I can tell, the wake also seems wider, it seems taller. So if you look at the bottom of the wake in this plane, the car with extensions has a wake that is blowing down more. That usually isn't a good sign for drag because a larger wake usually means more drag. But we'll have to see what other planes and data show because this is just one plane again, isolated by itself and is not entirely representative of the entire flow field. But one interesting point is that one study actually suggests that having the wake elongated downstream, as you can see for this bottom one with the extensions, that correlates with lower drag. But the reason why it isn't, isn't it covered here, um, it says that it's correlated, not caused. So maybe it is caused and maybe it isn't. Maybe this longer wake means that we do have a lower drag or maybe that's just a coincidence. Maybe more research is needed to understand why that correlation has come, out, come about. Anyway, that's just an interesting little um, uh, topic there. Now, in figure 17, we see another telling sign. So what this shows is how much energy is in the flow because of turbulence. So the thermal kinetic energy, TKE, and this is a very important property when it comes to CFD, like literally so much of CFD has gone into trying to figure out how to accurately model of this energy. This is very important when it comes to turbulence. So what this shows is how much energy there is because of this turbulence. And in essence, here it is wasted energy because we're not using this energy for anything. Most of this energy will eventually be lost to viscosity because there are changes in the velocity fields here and viscosity wants to uh, diminish those. So it's going to sap away energy. And from that point of view, the regular car with the one on the top has far more thermal kinetic energy here because there is far more just in this flow and that will lead to more energy lost because of viscosity and for no good reason which means that that is drag so this plot here suggests that the top flow the top car should have more drag because of that now on table two we now see the overall effects of these extensions on the lift and drag coefficients the drag coefficient is in the first row and with the extensions so that a cavity is forming behind the car we now see a 13.6% drop in the drag coefficient. That is huge. But in the fourth column from the right, the lift coefficient increases by 8%. That's a little interesting because we saw earlier that there was lower pressure under the, the car in the center plane, which, which is just a lower drag coefficient. But here we have a higher one, and that shows that there are other things going on as well. And while this increase doesn't seem like, it, while this increase seems important, it doesn't really matter too much for this car because that figure is more to do with high speed handling and this car isn't really used for high speed anything. It's important just to know though because these extensions could be used on other cars and maybe those cars would suffer because of this higher lift coefficient but they might be benefit from the lower drag too. So why is the drag lower overall? Well it seems like from what we saw from these figures First of all, in figure 11, the pressure is higher in the wake when we have the extensions. So just back here, you can see it's a bit higher to around three as opposed to four, oh, sorry, minus three compared to minus four. And that alone could really account for almost all this 14% change because the wake of the car accounts for so much of the car's drag and changes here magnify and have large overall changes to the drag coefficient. In addition to that, the thermal kinetic energy is lower in the wake now, which should also result in lower drag produ production too, because viscosity is going to sap away all this energy and these um, changes in velocity, and that's just going to be drag. Then on top of that, the vortices created seem weaker, which will then lower the vortex drag as well. So we saw in this plane, these vortices are probably weaker, and that's because of these edge extensions are creating a more stable wake, and that should reduce drag. So there seem to be a few mechanisms involved in lowering the drag of this car. And that brings us to this podcast. If you liked it, hit the me liking and subscribe buttons. And if you'd like us to sell your very own car, let us know here. And if you're interested in learning open foam, then check out our Black Friday sales here. Peace and amigos.